thinking, Ella. Thinking a lot. And watching. It's like people uh, who had a choice a long time ago between uh, you know, having all them nice things or uh, freedom. Of course, they uh, chose comfort. But comfort is freedom. It always has been. The whole history of civilization is a struggle against poverty and need. No, no, that, that's not it. That's never been it. I mean, them privileges just buy us off. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings, this is Byrne, the anadromist coming from Tbilisi, Georgia, and happy Eastern Orthodox Christmas to you here on the 16th of April. Well, <clears throat> this, as you can see from the title, is an update, and it is a bit of a serious one, but I want to start off with the good things first, and then I'm going to have a point where you can jump off if you're not interested in hearing me complain or anything like that, but... I suppose some of you are wondering, Burn, where's the rest of the Cute and Creepy series? And if you listen to the whole thing, you'll understand why my brain has not been quite in the position to fix it. I was just about to, when I got this head cold that I'm just getting over, you may hear it, um, and it just sapped all my strength for the last four days. So, but it, it feels like I'm pretty much out of the woods, but I still need to watch myself. <clears throat> But I, I was actually like all set up to record the uh, the audio for it when uh, suddenly my uh, my throat was attacked. Uh, these things happen. Well, and also I did put out that uh, short kind of introductory video to the idea of a gathering in Georgia, and since then I've had six people out of the twelve or thirteen that uh, I would need to make it work. Get in touch with me and give me what I would consider fairly uh, decent commitments to coming uh, and financially as well. So, that means there are six or seven possible seats left. And like I said, if I got too many more than that, I would uh, consider doing a second one in the month of October. But you, if you're at all thinking about possibly... Uh, wanting to come to Tbilisi, which would be, for for some of you, the adventure of a lifetime. Uh, there was one person that I approached about coming, and she said, I just don't know anything about it. It's, it's a strange, unfamiliar place. Exactly. But let me underscore this. It's a strange, unfamiliar, safe place. That is to say, I'm not expecting any military incursions or street violence or anything like that. You can walk around at night if you're a woman at 2 o'clock in the morning and no one's going to harass you. So, whoever you are, you should think about coming. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, about go and watch that video. <clears throat> uh, life has been pretty good lately, apart from a couple of uh, bumps in the road. And, and one bump was this minor cold. And maybe it was COVID-ish. Who knows? Who cares? I don't, um, but uh, basically I've stayed away from everybody for four days, so I don't think anybody got too infected by me. Recently I was at a, a fine dinner and wine tasting by, uh, hosted by uh, Bachana Havashi, and he is a great puppet maker. Let me give you an example of some of his puppets. And uh, they're just beautiful and exquisite works. And I'm actually putting together some videos which will soon be on my Georgian Crossroads channel. And he's also a winemaker. And, and I don't mean he's making stuff at home, although everyone in Georgia seems to do that. But he is actually a serious vinter and uh, has produced some award-winning uh, concoctions, shall we say, uh, fermentations. 
including he passed on to me a tarragon cha-cha, which I'm not going to get into explaining, but it, it did win some awards in the past. So there you go. Um, recently uh, have met some more Russian people from the Russian diaspora, and I'll explain a little bit about more why the how the Russian diaspora has been affecting me. But um, it's been an interesting time. I have had a few people get in touch with me and say, burn. So we heard some stuff in the news about Tbilisi and protests. I go like, yeah, about once a year we have things like that. And the protests worked and the people put away this bill that clearly seemed inspired by some sort of Russian influence. But truthfully, we go back and forth on protests here. Pro-LGBT, anti-LGBT, you know, pro, uh, uh, we don't get any pro-Russia ones uh, here, but we do get people every now and then, about once a year, we have something that you kind of got to stay away from. But I, as I told uh, someone who asked me about it, don't think of it as the Middle East where things are going to blow up. Think of it more like France, you know, Paris, where every once in a while you're going to get strikes and things are shut down. It's not even quite on that level. It's just... About once a year or so, there's something that makes everybody gather down in front of the parliament building. And so, we're good. Uh, it wasn't like the city was completely going crazy or anything like that. The The Western news media tends to blow these things up. And, and people just get, you don't hear about the place when it's just normal. So, your impression is only that, oh, things are happening. Well, it's just like... You know, January 6th, 2021. Was all of America in uproar? No. It was just a small little pinprick of, what, 335 million people? Yeah, no, it was just a pinprick. Did it have ramifications? Yes. But still, it's not like the whole country goes insane. Well, likewise here, if there's a, you know, I don't know, maybe there were 10, 20,000 people down there protesting. So that's, that is large by the scale of the country, but it wasn't a big deal. So I'll stop there on that. But I have been meeting new friends and having excellent conversations and, and excellent conversations with old friends getting together. Um, it has been a good time. It has been meaningful. That's more important. <clears throat> now, next week... Just to let you know what's coming up, there will be another anecdotes video about uh, my relationship to 10 different types of animals in Alaska. And I'll, I think you'll find this really fascinating because I would be willing to bet that most of you haven't been around those animals. <laughs> and so uh, what can I say? It's, it's a different sort of world. Also, uh, I've got another one down the road of uh, prophetic voices, uh, recordings of people from the past talking about things that are still very uh, meaningful to us today. I wanted to say relevant, but relevant is a word that, you know, it's like what relevant to whom. It all depends. And I do hope to get the uh, rest of the Cute and Creepy series out, at least part three, which will be the first half of the dark history of the cute that should be coming out. I would say within a couple of weeks. So there is hope. Um, hopefully reality doesn't sandbag me. Um, sandbag. I love that phrase. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm also giving a lecture on puppetry and reality at this kind of cafe, um, coffee house place called auditoria, which also hosts, uh, people speaking about things and it'll be on April 26th at like eight or clock in the evening or so, seven or eight. And, um, that should be interesting. It'll be largely to a Russian audience of people who are, have come over the border since all, all hell broke loose up in Ukraine and, uh, also in Russia itself. And I'll also be doing a similar lecture. It, it's being set up for me amongst uh, theater people um, for uh, Georgian theater people in one of the universities. I don't know as much about that yet. But anyway, that's where we are. 
And then there's the eternal question, which I'll deal with more in a moment, but what about getting my library here from Alaska? And let me just say this right now before I give the warning. Uh, there will be a second fundraiser. The things I am waiting to try to understand is how, mu how much they are expecting from me in taxes, uh, customs taxes. And that is a big one. And that can go any number of directions. But there will be a second fundraiser. I've got to get out and do that. But I've been kind of down lately. And that's what we're coming to here. There's just been some... One of the reasons my head hasn't been in the the cute place or the creepy place, maybe it's more in the creepy place is because of some of the things that have been going on with me financially. So at this point, I'm going to give you a warning. If you're just a casual listener who comes along, just wants to know what's happening with burn, what what's coming up. Uh, I've given you a few morsels here. If you don't want to hear me complaining, if you don't want to hear, you know, discussion about what's going on with burns money and stuff like that, bail out now. That's all I'm going to say. It's time to leave. Uh, go ahead. I'll wait. I did me mention the Russian invasion. Now, what happened? Uh, the Russians invaded Ukraine. And at that point... Maybe about 10,000 people or so. No, I think the initial number was like more like 45,000 people left Russia and came here. Now, out of that, eventually those people got whittled out and funneled out to other places. And maybe there was about 30,000 people. It did send all of the apartments. Uh, the apartment rates went up. Uh, the Georgian landlords who had been hurting because of the pandemic, said, this is our chance to make some more money. Other people thought the same. Uh, many of these people uh, were people who were connected to the internet, who were also the kind of people... Th Russia didn't hemorrhage um, people who were peasants. They, they hemorrhaged people who, shall we say in America, were kind of well-heeled. They knew what they were doing. They were also trying to protect their money from being confiscated. Um, YouTubers, uh, IT workers, all sorts of people. People who are the entrepreneurial types in Russia. Well, money came from them into Georgian banks and started to cause a rise in the lari. The lari is the Georgian currency. It's divided in lari and tetri. Tetri is like cents. And so things started to change as far as the worth of the dollar. <clears throat> Then came Putin's first mass mobilization uh, call. Suddenly at the northern border up in the Caucasus with Russia, 300,000 people. The queue of vehicles at the Georgia border backs up for miles with similar scenes Kenya. reported. In now, many of them used uh, Georgia as a transit point. So they came here, they went on to Armenia or Turkey or caught planes to Thailand or other countries which would allow them in. Most of Europe, unless you had a Schengen Pass, I have one friend who's Russian here who has a Schengen Pass and she was able to go. But if you didn't have a Schengen Pass, you couldn't go to Europe. And uh, don't, don't even try to go to America, I don't think. Uh, so... So what seems to be left is maybe that original 30,000 plus another 100,000. Now, that's a lot of people in a country of, some people estimate about 4.5 million. Um, it could be between 4.5 and, and 5 million, but we'll say it's in there. Another 150, maybe, thousand people show up. Well, the, the apartment rent... Uh, apartment rents went even higher. The, the prices for property went higher. Um, but the, these Russians also came uh, setting up businesses. This place, Auditoria, is like a new place for Russians uh, who want to stay in touch with Russian culture, which is here in more than it was. I mean, it was uh, there was always a bit of Russian culture here. And the people above, say, the age of 45 all still speak Russian, uh, as well as Georgian. 
But what that did to me personally was, for one thing, against all expectations. What I was expecting, and what I think a lot of people were expecting, was when the pandemic was over, the Georgian currency would just keep going downhill. Why? Because obviously the American and European currency would be higher. And it started to do that. A year ago, the, uh, the dollar was worth 3.40 tetri. 3 lari, 40 tetri. Today, it's worth 2 lari and 52 tetri. Now, that's about a third of the value or, or so. In other words, whatever I was living on a year ago is now wor it's worth a third more than it was. Add to that two other factors. One, uh, cheapers. One factor is that I, uh, all, all the prices went up by about 25%, all the food prices. Secondly, these rent prices got crazy. And in fact, I got a message on my phone from my landlord's sister. Now, my landlord is cool, but his sister sends me a message saying, I've got to pay, we'll say, 300% uh, more rent <laughs> overnight. She says, you have to do this. And she pointed out to some dodgy clause. Fortunately, I didn't panic. I just called up some friends who are Georgian and said, what's going on here? And they said, oh, they can't do this to you because the, uh, the contract won't allow it. And I said, great. But I did understand the problem. Now, my landlord was deeply apologetic about this because he said that, uh, you know, his sister just went ahead behind his back. He had come over a few days before that, and I'm sure something like this happened. He went back and she goes, where did you go today? And, she, and he said to her, oh, I was at my apartment um, and I had to work with the heating. And then she said, how much are you charging for that apartment? And he said, the rather small price I was paying. Uh, and she said, oh, we could make so much more. And so she didn't even wait for him. She got my uh, email, my text number, my phone number, and sent me this message. And he was just like grief stricken <laughs> that she had done this. So he came over to apologize. I also had a friend here who spoke Georgian and translated for me. And so, but I realized, you know, all these prices are going up. But being a Georgian, for the Georgians, it doesn't matter that your money is worth more to the Americans. It isn't doing you that much good. Your money is worth, you, you're working with 20, 20, 25% inflation. So I said, let's do this. Since my rent was lower anyway, let me give you 50% more. And he thought that was fair. And we, we settled with that. But that does mean my rent went up 50% besides the inflation and besides my currency being worth less, which meant suddenly, oh man, a year ago I was doing fine. Now things, I feel it. It's not like I'm in danger of losing any money up until <laughs> beginning of February. I go and check my bank. I'm going like, I get social security because I'm above the age of you know, being able to collect it for retirement. I go and look and uh, there's no money. So I go to the, uh, Social Security site that says, my my Social Security has been suspended. <laughs> I'm going like, oh no. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting too excited. And believe me, when that happened, I was like, what? I figured, okay, some crazy sort of mistake somewhere, some bureaucratic thing. Well, evidently, what I didn't realize is every two years, they send you in the mail, wherever you live, some sort of form to sign and then send back to them, you know, 60 day turnaround. Well, sending a piece of mail here is just like opening up a garbage can, putting it in and closing it. It did not get to me. <laughs> so, uh, and I didn't know they were trying to. Now I know every two years to watch out for this effect. But uh, it took, I mean, I went for, I suddenly had to dig into the money that I had uh, stash, stashed away for a rainy day here to start paying for rent and food bills and everything else. Uh, you know, all my utilities and such. And so I got behind on everything. And then eventually, and I went through these terrible 
emails where it was just seemed like I was getting a new person. It was in Greece is where the social security office is, not even in America. So anyway, without going all into that, eventually it started coming. Well, especially at that point, and, and now you can understand why my brain was in no place to write about cute things. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I just felt like, uh, and, and here's what, here's what's really been feeding on my head. So some of you may be wondering, well, Burn, why are you doing another fundraiser? Didn't we help you get the money? Well, I mentioned at that time, the money was for two things, finding a place to live and, uh, getting my stuff here. Well, the finding a place to live took a lot more than I thought it would. So I lost $3,000 on, uh, storage rental costs back in America since then. I lost $1,000 in security deposits, a ASA security deposit, when the Georgians told me I couldn't uh, get a loan here because I was too old. Uh, go back and check out older uh, videos for that one. Um, so I did find this place, and one of the reasons it worked for me is because it was empty. Well, being empty, I had to fill it with my own stuff. So I bought a couch and a chair and all this wood looks beautiful, doesn't it? All this wood, uh, I had to have milled literally. <laughs> I mean, it was, <laughs> and, um, and then it cost me over 300, $400 to put that thing together. And I've got to do it several more times before I'm done. Um, oh, I bought a stove and a television, uh, a desk, several small tables, uh, kitchen chairs, uh, a, an oven, <laughs> a bed to sleep on. You get the idea. Um, and, and some other odds and ends, plus, plus practical things to work on, like a, a saw to work on the bookshelves, uh, tools, paint, uh, um, varnish, all sorts of stuff. So... Basically, um, that along with all the other expenses, mean when my money went down, 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 down. <coughs> so I was actually counting on that uh, social security money. Sorry for coughing there. It just uh, let me finish this up because you can't talk. That's one of the reasons I can't make any videos is I can't talk very long, and I need to, and I need to go bake a little chicken I have. So you know, think about me and the chicken when you're done with this. If you get this message, if you listen this far, when you when you write a comment, make sure you just just put the word chicken somewhere in it, uh, just even at the end, or just the word chicken, and I'll know, you know, the we know, and the other people who didn't get this far won't know. So, uh, so getting my library here. Here is the big thing that's weighing on my head. I was really hoping to go in August this year to get my library here. Last year, I didn't try because I knew the, the war was there and it just seemed too unpredictable. This year, the big hold up is my own money. And uh, I mean, yeah, I've still got some money left, but not enough to do the whole thing and survive in any meaningful sense. So what I'm thinking about is why do I have to get my library here? You know, I've been seriously thinking. One thing I've thought about is, okay, there's a lot of stuff I can slaughter off that I won't need once I get there. Not the books and records, but pieces of furniture, my television set, um, all sorts of uh, tools. Tools go really well in Alaska. A lot of those tools I can sell. Um, and I have a yard sale. Everyone will come like vultures and take the stuff away. My bed I don't need. Um, all of that. So that's one way I've been thinking. Another way I've been thinking is this. I've got tons of journals and photos and items collected of my own historical past. I've got plus all these uh, uh, CDs that I've burnt of my lectures and of my uh, historical uh, investigations on radio. My 88 part series called uh, the 20th century that I did for a radio station in Alaska. 
uh, all of this stuff that needs to get here. Most importantly, for my sake right now, I've, I've actually faced the fact, okay, what if I can't bring this stuff here? And I've left my, uh, my uh, instructions to my friends. I said, you know, if I die before I get back, and, and you may think I'm being hyperbolic, but I'm 67 years old. And while my health is right now pretty good, I can walk up the side of the mountain, it's not going to stay that way. And that's just reality. And, and when you get past a certain point, death becomes real has definable features. You know, I watched my mother die uh, holding her hands without any doctors intervening. I know what death looks like, and I know I've got stuff i got to do before I die. And right now, time is just slipping through my fingers because my archive, particularly my, my, uh, my, my uh, writing is back there. And there was a lot of writing I was hoping to get done. I've been here now over four years. And that's been really nice. I haven't got much writing done. I've got a lot of videos made. That's good. I'm sure that'll, that's a nice thing to have accomplished. But what I really thought I would be accomplishing now, I'm not. So I want to. And what's hanging over my head is the idea that I have a 400-page rough draft handwritten novel back there that needs to get published. And if I die, I'm sorry, I'm just dumping this stuff on you, but if I die, it's just going to stay in this unfinished condition. You know, I have uh, all these photos. There's so many things besides all the stuff that I wanted to give to you guys online uh, that I thought would be very interesting. So, what can I say? Um... It's hanging, it's hanging over my head. And, and it's at this point you start wondering, well, what, what, what is the point of everything I'm doing? Well, for one thing, I've never had a problem knowing what I was doing. I've never said, who's Byrne? I know who Byrne is. The, the real problem that Byrne faces in his life is working against the daily stuff that prevents you from doing what you're trying to do. And so many different kinds of daily things. It really is the, the cares of the world. And, you know, it's the fact that I've never had a, a free point until this point, which is what, what is killing me now, is that I should be writing now. <laughs> and all of my outlines for stories and all of my ideas and everything is back in Alaska. Okay. I'm going to end this here before I get too uh, maudlin and morbid. And just say this. First of all, thanks. Thank you that many of you were largely responsible for helping me raise the money that I have had. And, and more importantly, many of you have gotten something out of what I've been doing and made me feel like I am getting a little piece of what's inside of me out. Because without doing this, this uh, video stuff, I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't started doing that. But what I started doing that because I realized how little money I would be earning here when I first got here and got a job. What I, uh, the reason I need to start another, I'm not going to go into all the gory details I just did here when I start the fundraiser. I will put on a nice, you know, realistic, but pleasant face for that because no one needs to hear a person complain when you're trying to ask them uh, for something like that. So it's, you know, poor mouthing is never accepted very well because people say, what can I do? You need so much. And I'm kind of like, well, all I need is just to get my library here. The rest of it, I don't care about because, and, and in fact, if someone could just say, burn, okay, you can bring back like, I don't know, uh, 500 pounds worth of stuff. I would, okay, okay, I'll work that out somehow. But I want the whole thing as much as possible. It's going to be thousands and thousands of pounds. But um, uh, here's what I want. I want. I need someone to take, you know, 10 20 $50, whatever, to go to the GoFundMe site and see if it's still alive. Now, I've gotten a few extra uh, 
additions a year later on that thing, but now it's like three years later or three and, uh, two and a half years later. So I need someone to go there. The link will be below and to attempt to donate to my site. If you're successful, then I'll know, great, I can just go through that when I need to start the fundraiser. And I would be deeply appreciative if you, if someone would just do that. Um, apart from that, uh, I, like I say, actually I'm doing well. And it's, it's life. You go up, you go down, you're born, you live, you go through different stages of life, and eventually you die. I'm trying to make the last stage of my life as meaningful as possible. If you're younger, you don't hear the clock ticking very loudly yet. Uh, the older you get, the more you do. But here's the interesting thing that I've learned. Interestingly, I've been uh, doing a lot of genealogical research lately, and I put out that video on it, and I did have a couple of people who left some snippy comments on there about, you know, it's just like, this is a cliche to do these things. Or are you trying to find your identity? No, I know who I am. I'm trying to find my history. And even the history of why, how I got to where I am. I know who I am. Where I am now and who I am now is not the question. But I'm fascinated by how. And someone else said, yeah, well, you know, I'm connected to, you know, four billion years of life or whatever. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't have names on it. You don't know Sid the Arthropod, you know. Uh, it, it's learning the actual names and then coming to places, because I think eventually all of us, if, if you have any record at all in the past, you eventually get to some kind of royalty because nobody else was keeping records. So I'm also related, besides being related to various kings and such, I'm also related to, you know, some farmer, some pig farmer in Scotland, probably, uh, you know, uh, 10,000 years ago. But we don't know his name or story. I'd love to know that. And so would you. You would love to know more about yourself. And, and the truth is, I've taken this all the way back, without going through all that I've done, I've taken it all the way back to the Roman era, believe it or not. The, the end of the Roman era. And, um, which is shocking to me. Shocking because I know so much about the, uh, all the places. <laughs> it's just like, huh? But I'm not bragging about anything. I'm just simply saying, wow, interesting. And, um, what I would like to say is that what I've learned about the, the clock ticking, and interestingly, what's very different about the clock ticking at the end versus the time frame of your mother being pregnant, you've got about nine months at the beginning, and then you're born. If you're not born in that time, you're probably not going to be born. But if uh, at the end, you don't know how long you've got. You don't know how long you've got right now. You can die tomorrow, get hit by a car. You could uh, get cancer in a week, find out something. Uh, whatever, you don't know. But the older you get, the more sure you are, you're not going to live forever. Especially if you've had any familiarity with death in your life, and I have. And so, and since I don't have children, which is another thing, this whole genealogical thing is kind of striking me as like, and I can't continue. You know, I don't have children. Who knows? Uh, I wouldn't consider myself 100% out of the equation. But it's certainly a lot less than when I was 25. <laughs> and, it, and it raises lots of questions. Why didn't I have children? We're not going to go into that now. But, uh, so, without having children, the only thing I have to pass on are these thoughts that I have had instead of children. So, thanks for uh, listening to me whine a little bit. <laughs> thanks for all your support. And uh, get ready to think about how you might contribute when the fundraiser actually starts. Or be one of the people who decides to see if the uh, GoFundMe account is still viable. All right. So, Droma Beat from Tbilisi, Georgia. We will meet again. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.